Hello and welcome to this interview with our lovely writer Karen Warren. Um, just briefly going to introduce her for our students and listeners or viewers, depending on where you're watching this. Um, Karen Warren is an Australian writer of horror, science fiction and fantasy short stories and novels. Her debut novel was the novel Slights, but she already wanted to be a writer from a very young age, uh, writing her first novel and short story at 14. Um, maybe she's going to tell us what that was about, maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> um, another interesting tidbit I'm going to share with you is that you may have wondered about the spelling of her name. As she shares on her website, that's actually a spelling she made up herself and did so in order to be more memorable, which I do think worked out well. So yes. welcome, Karen, and thank you for doing this interview with us. Oh, thank you so much for turning around. Thanks, Lucas, as well. Yes, yeah. I did. That was before the days of um, Google as well. It was just when I was finishing school and there were five Karens in my class and I did want to be a bit more memorable and it's definitely worked. It's certainly fantastic now that uh, Google is a thing. Um, there's only one other Karen Warren spelt the same way in the world and she lives in Los Angeles. So it's been very good. <laughs> Interesting that there is another one though. I know, I know. There's quite a few Karens spelt the same way, but actually most of them, there's quite a few men who are named Karen oh. spelt that way, which is, oh. yeah, quite fascinating. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. I can tell you a little bit about the first novel if you wanted to. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About that. yeah, go ahead. Um, just, yeah. Um, just, yeah, I really did always want to be a writer. And then only at about 14, um, a family friend really took me more seriously than other people did. And she said, yes, you can do this, but you need to, you know, she really gave me, gave me some good advice about trying to sell short stories and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, I read the novel by S.E. Hinton called The Outsiders. I don't know if that's um, a book that you've read there. That it was a movie made out of it and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I loved that book. And then I found out that she was actually a 15-year-old girl. And that really made me realise that, well, if she can do it, I can do it. So I wrote a novel mm -hmm. called Skin Deep, which was pretty much a ripoff of the outsiders it was two different groups of boring teenagers um, who get along in the end kind of thing with lots of drama in between but it was a really 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 great I mean I still think it's pretty good for a 14 and I finished I think I was finished by the time I was about 16 um, and I still think it's quite good I mean it's obviously the plot wasn't really my own I was following somebody else's plot but I sat down and I wrote character studies and analysis and I really really thought about how to make each character different and what language they would use and all that sort of thing. Um, so it was fantastic practice for me. The hard work of it too, like it's about 50,000 words I think which is a lot for someone of that age. Um, it never got Definitely. Published. It got close to um, being published. It actually had a, a publisher interested here in Australia um, but by the time I managed to do some edits and type it all up again with my very slow typing like this, um, they'd already published a similar story and they said, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it was one of those little, little interesting things of life. Like I could have been published really early and instead mm. I didn't publish my first short story until I was 28 years old. So probably another 12 years later before I even sold a short story. So <laughs> quite a long process. <laughs> so, I, I guess a, a kind of follow-up question would be like, so how how was the journey back to writing then uh, because that that is a, a period of time right? yes yes well I was writing in between but not as seriously I suppose I was writing a lot of short stories and I'd started a few novels but not finished them so I was definitely writing short stories and I started again trying to be published probably at about 23 um, mm -hmm. So it was probably six years before I thought, well, actually, I've got some things I can start sending out. But then I didn't actually sell a story for another five years. So it did take five years of me sending stuff out and lots and lots of stories going out. Mm -hmm. and, and progressively more um, getting closer to the line, I suppose. Like I, I started getting ticks in boxes that said, love the story, but not quite right for us. And then I started getting requests for rewrites. And so really, as my, um, you know, as I practiced and as I got better at it, um, I started to get closer and closer to publication. So, yeah, I was always writing, but there definitely was a little period of time where I didn't think I was going to be a writer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then after I sold that first story, then I did um, sort of start the pathway to actually being a published author. 
Mm. So yeah, it was. Um, it's. I've been doing it for a long time, and it really published stories ever since. Um, every single year, I've had at least one or two stories in print. Even when my kids were little, like my kids are now twenty-two and nineteen, but even when they were little, I would try and write a little bit, at least once a week or something, and try to send story, keep sending stories out when I could, mm. um, just to keep that um, sense of myself, I suppose, that I didn't just get. Which I mean, I mm. love being my children, but it can be very absorbing as well. Mm. Uh, really wonderful to have um, to be able to maintain that, that um, sense of myself I guess throughout. I think that's probably a good so tip for uh, students and listeners as well just to keep writing if they want to be a writer. I, I know yes. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> yeah oh look it's so important and even when you don't have time so even when my son was just born and he was tiny and you know, they take all of your time, 38 hours per day, they take. Um, <laughs> but I was always thinking, and even when we went for long walks, I would be observing and thinking and taking little notes and trying to absorb as much as I could. So when I did have time to write, I could, I would have things to write about. So I think that's really important too, is be really observant and keep thinking about the ideas, even if you haven't got the chance to write about the ideas. Mm -hmm. So you started with like a kind of literary fiction in the vein of The Outsiders and you kind of moved, I guess I would say more <laughs> towards Australian speculative fiction in general as, as uh, you became a writer. Uh, and we we're wondering if you would label your own writing in that kind of way. Well, look, I think it's interesting. I do think that Australian speculative fiction has been different in the past in that we merge the genres a little bit more maybe than, um, other people, not, not everybody else does. So we blur the lines between horror and science fiction and fantasy a little bit more. And we draw in crime a little bit more and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as far as that goes, I do. I certainly try to use um, Australian settings um, a lot, which, which sets it apart because they are, some of them are quite different to other settings um, and tone of voice and that sort of thing. So I think to a certain extent, there, there is um, a certain style that Australian speculative fiction writers do have. Which is good. And I think more so, I think we're able to, I think for a long time, people tried to write um, probably mostly in the American style of writing, um, just because that's where the bigger publishers were and that sort of thing. But I think, I believe actually these days we're, um, we're, allowed, we're able to write a bit more in our own voice. Certainly I feel like I am. Um, I do have argue whenever I have, a, you know, especially the larger pieces, um, there are a lot of discussions with the American publishers about particular words and turns of phrases that they haven't heard before, but that are really important to, to me. This, yeah, some of them are hard. Some of them I have to let go because they work well in language um, when I'm speaking, but they are kind of strange, I suppose. In, so there's, there's, certain, there's an Australian uh, little inflection that we have where sometimes a particular, if you're from a particular place, you put but at the end of a sentence. So, like, if we're talking, if I was talking to you and you'd say, "Oh, how's your evening been?" I'll say, "Oh, but I, I'm great, but I haven't had my I haven't had my dinner butt." So I'll put the butt <laughs> at the end rather than at the beginning. Um, and it's a really particular Australian thing, and it makes me think of a particular kind of Australian. Um, but it doesn't come across well on the written page, I don't think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that one I have to let go. But they, yeah, that's really interesting, those discussions that you have. I mean, I suppose you would, you would certainly find it so, very much in translation, like when you're translating your work to English and, and the other way too. Um, those choices of words that you make as you're, as you're reading or as you're translating. Yes, it's very interesting. And it's, it's interesting what kind of inflections, as you said, words are getting, you know, kept in the books and which ones as you heard you have to let go of that's that's yeah. interesting <laughs> yeah yeah I've been I translated a few times and there was one story I had translated into Polish and the story is called all you can do is breathe and it's about a man who survives um, a terrible a terrible accident and some days that's all he can do he says is all it all I can mm -hmm. do is breathe but when the Polish person was um, translating it, didn't, that didn't quite work for him. And I can't remember what he ended up doing, but he had to change it slightly because it was just the inflection and the balance of the words just didn't work in the translation. So it was hard for him to try, because it is quite a, a theoretical um, title, I suppose. Like it's not a simple title, it's kind of a theoretical title. So yeah, mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Yes, uh, we have a couple of students who are actually doing a master's in translation studies, so oh. they'll be happy to hear that. And, and yes. 
surely have some things to think about right now. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, look, it's really, really is fascinating. Just all of the choices, the words and how you capture slang and oh. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Actually, Slights was um, translated into Turkish. I never actually got to see a copy, copy sadly. But um, there's a lot of um, rude bits in that book. And I, I heard from the translators that they had to cut a lot of that out because it just wasn't appropriate for their readership. So it would have been a much thinner book, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but also that was really interesting too. So there's some of that sort of the moral standards of the country as well, which need to be taken into account. Yeah, I think that goes to show you that a translation can be a wholly different work in some cases. Yes. And, so, and as, um, just this is probably a stupid question, but have, did you read, do you read my stories in, in, in translation or in English? We're yeah. reading them in English. Okay. Oh, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> yes. Well, so, yeah, that's so uh, you're really getting them straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> so, as, as Australian fiction and Australian speculative fiction in particular, is often rather overlooked internationally, perhaps also because of these translation issues that you brought up. Do you have any favorites or recommendations that you can tell us about? I have so many, like this is one of those really hard questions. And what I'd love to be able to send you a list, like I'll actually, I might email you a list if that's okay as well. Oh, um, yes, because we would, we would love that. Good. Okay, because there's really are there are so many, and you know, really, it's it's a very strong industry here. Um, but at the top of my head now, I'm going to say first up that we're quite a close community here too. So we all, a lot of us, actually know each other. Um, so these are just some people this year who had short story collections out, which I think are very good. So there's Cat Sparks, who's a science fiction writer. Tim Napper, who does science fiction um, crossover horror type stuff, is very very clever. Um, Joanne Anderton, I'm just writing her introduction for her latest short story collection, which is absolutely brilliant. And um, she's another one who, she's a writer who's a very gifted writer who works very hard as well. Like she doesn't just write a story and think that it's perfect. Mm. I can actually mm. see the crafting that she does in her stories and uh, really, really impressive. Uh, Aaron Dries is a horror writer who does amazing work. And Angela Slater, um, who writes horror and uh, fairy tales, twisted fairy tales, etc. that sort of stuff. Um, she's doing incredibly well um, in the UK and in America as well. So that's just a very few. Um, and I'll send you, I'll, I'll send you the, a list of those names and plus add some others too. Oh, um, wonderful. So, Looking forward yeah. to that. <laughs> yes. When it, when it comes to the works that have affected your writing, you already mentioned The Outsiders as kind of a, a, definitely a, a big influence in, in your first work, but as you've continued writing, are there works that you kind of come back to, or is there one particular work of fiction that's inspired you the most? Oh, look, again, there's so, so many. Um, so I started off reading Enid Blyton and Agatha Christie, and I do actually go back to Agatha Christie in particular and just see the way she crafts stories and crafts character. Um, I actually think she does a really good job of it, to be honest. Um, but I, the book that I come back to over and over again, or oh, there's two, both by Daphne du Maurier. So I come back over and over again to Rebecca and The Scapegoat, both of which are just the most utterly brilliant, brilliant books. And I read them probably every couple of years. And every time I'm so blown away by just the brilliance of them, just the building of character, the building of story, the gentle, the gentle, apparent gentleness of both of them, but mm. actually <laughs> devastatingly horrifying um, at the same time. So that, yeah, those are my real go-to. I also really love um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, which was written a long time ago, like that's kind of in the 60s or something like that, I think it was written. Um, but again, it's one of those ones, it's, it's the bravery of language that he uses and the, and the, the strength in storytelling. Um, I also love William Golding, um, who wrote Lord of the Flies, but some of his other work that I am really inspired by. Um, again, because of his bravery in storytelling and his lack of the ordinary, um, which is something that I always strive to write. But every now and then I'm tempted to write in an ordinary way because it's probably easier to sell and more accessible. And when I do that, I actually will go to and read something by William Golding and realise I don't, I know, no, 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 I, he didn't be ordinary, I don't have to be ordinary. Um, so yeah, that's a real, real, I really do use him as an as a inspiration to try to, you know, keep writing outside the box, which I think is important. I think that's a message to all of the writers who are listening as well. 
you have to be so brave in your voice and be strong in your voice so that it's your individual um, way of writing, not writing like mm -hmm. somebody else. I think that's really important to find that voice and then be brave enough to stick to that voice. Thank you. And I think uh, having read some of your short stories, you definitely went there and <laughs> get it right. <laughs> Well, I read that you picked some older ones, a really interesting um, selection of stories and some that I hadn't probably read in 10 years or something. So I actually had to go back and read them again. And yeah, there were certain moments when I'm, oh gosh, did I do that? Okay. <laughs> I'm really, do you mind if I ask how you selected them? I'm really interested. Like it's a great, it's a really interesting um, selection of stories. I'm really very pleased with the selection, but I'm also curious to know how, how you chose them. Yeah, well, um, the another week in the future excerpt that that happened because we'd looked into previous Australian speculative fiction, and so we came across a week into the future, and seeing that there had been a response to that, that was really cool. So we thought that's yeah. a good that's a good thing to to put up there. Um, yeah, uh, with the one in in baggage, that's actually one of the first anthologies of Australian speculative fiction that I had available to me because I taught wow. Australian speculative fiction a couple of years ago uh, already and um, basically I just thought the the context was really interesting because it was so focused on Australia in some ways I mm. thought that would, that would be really interesting to read. Mm. <laughs> oh, in, yeah, in, it's a really really I really do love that anthology it's one of my favorite ones that I've been mm. in and I know you had one oh, we can, one of the things you were going to ask me is how like that was actually the editor Gillian Pollack's idea that concept mm. of um, thinking about what we bring with us because a lot of people do come from uh, other countries to live in Australia mm. and we also move around a lot and then she thinks a lot about what um, what baggage our parents give us but then it's not just about, you know, baggage isn't always negative, is it? Like, I mean, if you have baggage, it means you've actually lived a life too. So I think that's really important to live, even though what can weigh you down, it also means you've, you've lived um, and experienced and connected with people. So, yes. Uh, yes. And yeah, I think she was really, um, very good in seeking out, like a really good cross-section of Australian uh, writers. It really is a very good go-to for some great writers in that, in that anthology. Absolutely, awesome. and then that's one of the reasons why we uh, chose it, basically. Um, with the other two, well, uh, we like Cosmic Horror, we like Cthulhu, so that was <laughs> that was an easy choice. <laughs> and War of the Worlds, that just uh, offered itself because of the connection to Australia. And uh, so that's a fairly new collection, as far as I remember. And when I saw that was something that existed, I immediately thought that's something that we have to include into our course somehow. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's such a great, um, such a great concept, mm -hmm. I think. And being able to dabble in that amazing world, um, I really enjoyed that, yeah. Mm. I mean, we are uh, we're also reading in our science fiction section, Terra Nullius, that also has connections to War of the Worlds. So it uh, really made sense to include that story. Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. Well, again, um, he really, the editors really wanted the Australian focus on the mm -hmm. stories in that too. And I'm, yeah, I think they, they, they worked well. Mm -hmm. and, and Absolutely. And when you write both short stories, and I, I, would, I would definitely say short stories predominantly in, in this sense, uh, do you feel that there's a... Uh, a strong relationship between what an anthology is kind of kind of looking for or are you kind of constantly writing uh, lots of different stories and you kind of see like oh does that fit into this anthology uh, kind of looking I guess under the hood of the writerly process there <laughs> yes no that's a good it's a really good question and these days um, because I'm mostly I'm commissioned to write stories so quite often the invitation will come and then I start thinking about how I can fit but it, really Lucas what I do is I've got stories cooking away mm -hmm. and then when the invitation come I say oh well I've got that idea or that idea or that idea and I try to figure out which one um, can actually fit the best Yes, um, it does take away something very specific, like, um, in fact, all of those are really quite specific. War of the Worlds, obviously, it was very specific. So I had to, I reread the book and then really got the, the idea for the story from that. Um, but at the same time, I am writing, um, you know, I have more bro broader anthologies that I need to write for. Um, so I'm sort of working on those stories at the same time. But when the invitation comes, that I, that's when I very specifically think about what 
you know, right to that anthology. Because you do have to hit their, you know, you've got to, you've got to hit the right notes for them. Otherwise, it's, it doesn't work. You know, if they're really specific in their um, needs, you have to try and hit those needs in your own individual way again, though, too, which is tricky. It's a tricky balance. I think so, and that, that's, a, that's a good answer because we've been talking about how the anthology frames, so it's nice to see that uh, this, does, this does affect the writing, both on the yes. writerly side and, and on the, the interpretive one. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, I was in, it, it's quite rare to have an anthology that isn't very specific in its theme or, or broad, broadly themed at least. It's very rare to have one that is just whatever you want to write. Um, just write horror or just write science fiction or just write a story. They usually have something, something there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's, um, it might be, I've done a couple of vampire stories, but they were in my, my own version of vampire stories. Uh, so yes, they, they mostly do have those those notes that they're trying to hit. Somebody's just done an anthology of um, Hallmark movie inspired horror stories, and it was really specific. I, mean, I didn't end up doing one for that because the deadline was very short, and I just wasn't didn't really have an idea for it. But yeah, he said that he'd um, taken lots of stories, but he had rejected ones that um, weren't Hallmark enough. So yeah, <laughs> that is very specific. <laughs> It is very specific. Mm. So I think, yeah, you do have to think about who your audience is. I think whenever you're writing, um, you write for your own self, obviously, but I think you do need to think about the end the, the end result as well and who's going to be reading it. I always use the example of telling somebody about your dream. You know, like, like when you wake up and you have this weird dream and you just want to tell somebody, but it's the most boring thing ever to hear somebody else's dream, right? Because they go, oh, but, oh, no, that didn't happen in this. And there's no end to it and there's no sense to it. And they're having a great time telling you what happened, but it's really boring. So you have to translate that dream into a story that's interesting for the reader. So you can have your one amazing idea for a story, but you need to try and write it in a way that is actually going to be interesting and not just telling somebody your boring old dream. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. Uh, I sometimes have dreams where I think that would be a good story. And then I wake up and I think that didn't make sense at all. So, <laughs> <But you laughs> so maybe I should approach use, it like this. <laughs> yeah, but you can use a lot of that dream in a story, though. Like, doesn't doesn't mean that you can't use, I use dreams all the time in stories, but you use elements of the dream and you write it down and then you figure out how to make a story of it. So the dream itself is not the story, but those moments of fear or even the weird images and things like I've used images that I've had in dreams and translated them into um, story mm -hmm. form. Yeah, so they can definitely inform your stories. But yeah, it's not just waking yeah, up and scribbling down the dream and then that's your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that would be very hard to read, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. So while we're still on the topic of anthologies, um, with specifically with the War of the Worlds and the Cthulhu one, were you a fan of these pretexts, these intertexts before, or was it something that you came into through the anthology? War of the Worlds, I was a, was definitely a fan um, of the music. I love that the album music as well. It's one of my go to listen albums, um, and the book I had read, but I reread it, and I absolutely love it. it it has barely dated for a book that's what over a hundred years old. It has barely dated at all. Um, so absolutely loved it. The Cthulhu, not as much. Like I don't mind Lovecraft, and I totally see what he's done um, for the genre and what he's created. And the mythologies are amazing. Um, I don't love his writing as much. So he, that's one that I really sort of had to go in and I've got to reread and. Um, figure out what elements I'm going to try and um, replicate or, or manipulate for the stories that I write. Um, yeah, so the one, the one in that story, in um, the Cthulhu one, um, was very much about the sea monsters and the rising for the deep and all that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. that's what I took from that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot more. <laughs> Yeah, with, with Lovecraft, I always think the, the ideas are much better than the writing in some cases. I, look, I, I hate to say it, but I think that's exactly right. The ideas <laughs> are great, but the writing, not so much. Whereas H.C. Wells, they have brilliant ideas, but the writing actually is incredible as well. War of the Worlds is, is such a small book. like It's a really thin book. It's almost a novella, I think. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. what it packs in there is in just impactful and devastating, really. I mean, horrifying human behavior as well as the martians behavior 
Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> really at, at, times, sci at times, science fiction really does face a lot of like criticism for this like lack of quality of writing. Uh, and it's always nice to be able to turn back to Wells, I think, and, and say, well, uh, even at the, even at its start, I mean, that's if we consider that the start in the English world. Um, <laughs> Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Even if we turn back, though, a hundred years ago, uh, there there is plenty of science fiction out there that does have uh, really strong writing as well, um, oh, like yes. Wells. Absolutely, yes. No, it's just, it's just one of those dismissive things. I find it easy to dismiss, but they and they're not doing that little bit of work it takes to actually find beautifully written stories mm -hmm. that are as easy as well written as anything that um, is considered literary and just far more interesting, shall we say. Lots of ideas and lots of things happening. Like just because stuff happens in a story, it doesn't mean it's badly written. Mm -hmm. I seem to think you've got to have these ponderous, long discussions about what the tree was like for 15 pages, whereas, you know. <laughs> no, you can't have that in fantasy as well. <laughs> no, well, that, that is true. That is true. <laughs> so, and, you know, Catherine Spence, so this is, oh, see, I've got a background on, so I don't know if we can see it. Yes. Oh, can you see it? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, I could see it for a moment. <laughs> Phases in and out. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, there we no, go. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. That's a lovely, oh, lovely sorry. copy, lovely edition. It's absolutely beautiful. So that is like, she, that was 1880 or something like that. So she was writing science fiction. That is actually, it's pure science fiction. It's a woman who goes into the future. So she was writing science fiction and has complete, completely ignored or nobody actually knows it. Um, it's Look, it's not, to be completely honest, it's, it's a brilliant idea, but she was so idealistic about what she wanted the future to be that it's very much about that. It's very much her creating this perfect world in the future. So not as much of the writing, um, storytelling part and more about the, this is what I hope it's going to be like, but still incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. a woman, a woman writing in that time, imagining a hundred years in the future, the politics and, you know, how the, the, the country will look and all that sort of thing is just incredible, really. I, I, think so. I, I actually, I read a, a secondary literature article on Australian fantasy, and that started off with talking about how the early Australian writing was very realistic and bound to realism. And one of the examples they named was Catherine Helen Spence. Like, oh, really? Have you read The Week Into the Future? I was very <laughs> confused by that. Yeah, well, I think she did write other, I don't actually know that much about her other novels, but she mm. did write um, other things as well. Mm. Yeah, no, she was an amazing woman, like really quite, I found, I discovered her when I was re researching something else and she just kind of popped up into my vision. Yeah, she was, she was quite fabulous. <laughs> she said she never married. She turned down any number of... Um, suitors because she just I think she thought I, I can't remember what her quote was it was something like they shouldn't have to put up with me and I don't want to put up with them or something like that like <laughs> she just knew she had a big life to live and she wasn't going to live it if she was um married with children I think it was just mm -hmm. the again an incredible uh, decision to make at that period of time yes it sounds yes, like I'm glad, she's on a list. I'm, I'm glad to know that she's on a list anyway that's good to hear <laughs> Yes, she is. Um, <laughs> why, well, since we just, you know, talked about a week into the future, why don't we skip a little to that short story first then? <laughs> oh, yes. Why not? <laughs> uh, what actually, I guess, inspired you to, in, in juxtaposition to Catherine Helen Spence, to write a more kind of pessimistic vision, uh, one could say? Yes, yes, I know. I feel mean having done that to a certain extent, but then I also I felt sad that her vision of the future didn't hasn't really happened as well, um, and I thought that was really sad because we're not really we haven't achieved those things we she wanted to achieve. We're still behaving as badly as we did back then, and we still have people starving and people kept in places they shouldn't be being kept and all that sort of thing. So I think I felt quite pessimistic about how badly we've done in the last hundred years. And then I was also thinking about um, what people think when they die as well, like in those, in, as your body's winding down, do you have a positive view of the world or do you have a more pessimistic view of the world? And just imagining her in the, in the her final days, um, not having such a, yeah, a positive view, dying very unwell, probably, you know, the, the body starts to take over the, uh, 
and the the brain starts to shut down a little bit more so yeah it was it was it did end up being quite dark um but it just mm. felt like it was a balance i guess to her her overly really in, in, in all honesty overly optimistic vision of the future <laughs> so yeah and i'm a horror writer so you know it's gonna that's That's gonna, a good point. Really, that was, it was really interesting reading back on that because I really had imagined quite a quite a, a big world, you know, quite big world changes and that sort of thing. That was that was lots of lots of fun and really interesting to just think about um, how we might be. And actually, at the same time, I was trying to think about how she would do it. So I was still trying to write through her point of view. Mm -hmm. So again, kind of an idealistic and simplistic, I guess, vision of the next hundred years in the future. So simplifying it rather than a, a, a broader imagined world. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very interesting, really, really interesting um, process. Even so, I think there are a lot of different like ideas that are in play in, in your short story. Um, like you, you tackle a whole range of disasters, including like different cultural shifts that involve like age, but also uh, the ecological problems that are becoming more and more pressing uh, due to the yes. global climate catastrophe. And... I guess um, one question is, what do you think is the role of literature and the short story in tackling these kinds of issues? Uh, because maybe uh, Catherine Helen Spence is too optimistic uh, for some reasons. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, look, I think, um, I would like to think that we can do something. I know there's a lot of writers who are working today, working today, they're writing novels um, set in catastrophic futures. Um, people have done that in science fiction going back for decades, really. Whether or not it helps, I don't know. Um, but I think that it can become, when you're just reading the news or watching the news or hearing scientists speak, people can shut it off and be not interested or lose interest or it becomes ordinary. But I think if you tell stories that are from real people, albeit in the future and albeit imagined, uh, maybe it uh, has more impact. That's the hope anyway. That's kind of what I try to do um, when I'm writing horror as well is um, write, write impactful stories um, because people relate to the characters, I suppose. So uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Kim's, is it Kim Stanley Robinson? I've gone blank on his name. I think that's who it is. He, he's writing incredible um, climate fiction at the moment. Um, quite, 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 um, real but also with a bit of optimism in there as well so lessons like he's I think he's trying to figure out ways out of where we are so mm -hmm. yeah I don't know. I'd like to think it has a role but then we're here where we are too and people have been writing science fiction like this for you know since the 1950s or 1940s really so I don't know and some say that you know that H.G. Wells was even looking at that too in um, War of the Worlds don't they that it's about the industrial revolution and pollution and long-term damage and all that sort of stuff so well, we don't know where we would be without novels and writing. So. Well, that's true. That is true. <laughs> that's true. Maybe it's slowed it down a little bit. Yeah. Hopefully. It open, it, it's an easy way to talk about ideas, I think, isn't it? And talk mm. about things um, through fiction and through stories. I would definitely agree. I think that sci-fi, in, I mean, in, even in comparison to the other speculative fictions, has so much ground for talking about political and social ideas, especially, yes. uh, because they, there are so often these kind of grander narratives uh, like your own, where you take, you kind of might be simplifying some things, uh, but it allows us to like highlight all of these really complex issues and be like, well, let's extrapolate for a little bit and think about what might actually yes, happen. Yes, no, that's fine. Um, and you can do it a little bit sneakily too. Like you can pretend that the story is a romance or it's something else that's going on. And then in the background, you've got this other stuff going on. So I think that's good too. You can almost um, subliminally put your put your story across or put your point across. Yeah. So Kat Sparks, also who I mentioned earlier, she she's um, now has she has a PhD in climate fiction and the effect of it actually. Um, so she's that's a PhD actually. I might see if I can um, get her connected up with you because that's certainly something you'd be interested in in reading. Absolutely. All that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh one thing that I really like about uh, Another Week in the Future, among others, is that the actual title is Another Week in the Future, an excerpt. I think oh, yeah. that was, <laughs> that's a very nice ploy to use in a short story. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, thank you for seeing my trick there. <laughs> 
Well, well, you know, I, I, I didn't want to spend 10,000 words or 15,000 words, you know, when I could just do it in snippets like that. Like I did feel like I could, I could show my snippets um, and get the point across and be within my word count and... Um, yeah, so yes, <laughs> I'll do a little trick, but hopefully and, and it worked. <laughs> you tell other people there's a lot more there, but you can't read it. <laughs> That's right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's an interesting experiment in form too, and I, I think you also do that um, in, in the Griefo, which we'll get to uh, later. Um, and But I, I guess a, a kind of quick question about that would be like, um, do do you feel like these kind of formal decisions you make, like, like that, for example, creating kind of an, an excerpt when when it's it's a short story in an anthology or or whatever. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, do you feel that those ideas kind of are just coming into the milieu of of you as a writer, or or where do you think you draw on for some of these formal ideas? Oh, look, it's a combination of everything. Usually, is it's kind of an instinct about the best way to tell a story. Um, that's mostly what it is. Um, and, and I do like to play with form a little bit as well of ways to tell a story. I've just, I've just sold a story about, a, um, there's another futuristic story about a city that's built on layer upon layer upon layer until it's thousands of feet high with different cities underneath it. And it's just like a, a huge mountain kind of thing. And the story is about the man falling off the mountain or falling off the city. And so he's falling down while I'm, while I'm telling the backstory of the city, he's falling down and I've got him falling down as sort of right justified text on the side. And the story of the city and the history is, is left justified, which is not, you know, I'm, people have done that before, but it just felt this sort of long skinny text down, down the right hand side of the page while he's falling and what he's seeing as he's falling. Um, just felt right for that story and, and a good way to tell that story. And in fact, the editor um, was confused by it at first because he thought I'd made a mistake. And so he kind of just merged it all together and it didn't work. I said, oh, can we please just do this? <laughs> and he agreed. Like, so yeah, so usually it's, it's how the story, um, instinctively how the story needs to be told. And I do like to play a little bit with how things look on the page, a bit like mm -hmm. poets do, I suppose. I love poetry that plays all over the page and is a picture on the page as well as just the words. And I, I think that really shows in your writing. I mean, a lot of authors that we end up reading in, in the university system tend to be like stuck kind of in one uh, niche, uh, whether mm. it's a, a generic or formal one, uh, especially if we're thinking about more recent literary fiction and the movements that are happening uh, in the broader uh, global literary market. And I'm wondering then, like, uh, how does genre play a role, if at all, when you write? Because uh, you do write a variety. Uh, you're not just a, uh, a sci-fi writer or just a horror writer. Um, so how, how does that, I guess, come into the writing process? Well, I, re I read really broadly. I, I read a lot of genre stuff, but I, I read crime. I don't read romance, but that's just not my, not my thing. Um, but I read a lot of non-fiction as well. So probably in a way I'm influenced probably more by the non-fiction I'm reading to a certain extent. Um, and probably as far as form goes in that as well, just the way it's laid out. Um, but I do read a lot of um, genre fiction. I've judged a fair bit. I've judged the World Fantasy Awards a couple of years ago and I've judged Shirley Jackson's. Um, so I've done quite a lot of judging. And when you do that, like with the World Fantasy, I read about 500 books came to my doorstep <laughs> a lot. Um, and so that was really actually interesting to see um, what people were doing that was stock standard and just following rules and what people were doing that was working outside of those rules and certainly how much more I enjoyed the ones that work outside the rules. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know, influenced in lots of ways, but also um, influenced by many other things at the same time. Well, I don't know, what, what story do we want to move on to then? <laughs> Maybe uh, we go, yeah, go you, back to Hive Glass. Did we finish? Yeah, um, let's, let's, uh, let's go back up to go back sure. in order. So uh, um, I think the first question you basically already answered. Um, I think I'm just going to basically ask a follow up question. Uh, you talked about how the, the topic really came from from Jillian Pollack, but how did you then? adapt your story to that? I think you say in your author's note that it, it was one that had been brewing before. So mm. how did you make it fit? <laughs> yes, well, Gillian said that one, that, that theme is very broad, I guess. Um, and so I did, yeah, 
I don't know. It was. It was. I definitely was inspired, as you, you said in your your question. I was really inspired by the con and by the concept of lost things, things that were once there and are no longer. Um, so, because my father was an immigrant in in the 19, uh, late 1940s he came to Australia or early 1950s and everything that he knew as a child was basically gone like so much of Europe changed as we know you know Europe changed completely after that war um, and so what he knew as a child was gone and while he didn't really talk very much about it I also had this concept that that place wasn't there for me to go to either so I couldn't go and visit where he was born or anything like that because that was all changed and gone um, so I feel like that was the baggage that I wanted to explore to a certain extent, yeah. And then fan across, yeah, true, I, might, I tend to read lots of non-fiction and read really broadly when I'm researching or thinking about a story, um, trying to gather little bits of snippets and all the little elements of the story that are going to make it right. And so I came across this, um, this the, the town, and there are many towns like this, that were there once and are there no longer. So they're not there for anybody to go back to anymore. Um, and it's really a sad, it's, it's, it really is a great loss, I think, to not have that home. It's like when your childhood home um, gets sold for one thing, but gets pulled down. You know, we go back to where your childhood home was and it's not there anymore. It's been pulled down and it's a block of apartments or something else is there. Um, yeah, it's interesting. A place I worked um, when I first came to Canberra, um, it was the science, our science organisation, and that big building is now gone. It's not there anymore. And so that all that remains is the memories of um, working there and the other people I worked with and all of their memories. But I can't ever go back to that place and say, oh, that's where my office was, or that's the view I had. It's gone. So I guess I wanted to explore a little bit of that sort of thing. And setting it in a country town, because in Australia, I don't know what it's like there, um, but country towns um, rise and fall and rise again sometimes. Um, and sometimes certainly young people leave, like most young people don't stay there. If they're born there, they don't stay there. They go out to the city to try and find you know, a bigger life for themselves. And so who's left behind are the older people and sticking to their routine sometimes. But um, So I think there's a great sense of loss, but there's also a great sense of continuity in the little towns. So that, that, there was all those things that Sean, the main character, because he'd lost his ancestral village, um, was clinging to this little village, this little town, country town as a place that is his and belongs to him now and that he is a very, very much a part of. Physically as well, of course, as, well, as I think your next question is going to talk about. <laughs> well, since you just talked about loss, Hive of Glass, the title rather refers to complete transparency. So can yes. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think I found that, um, that was a quote that I found and I should have cut and pasted it because I can't remember who said it now. Um, but it's definitely about, um, yeah, it's just, a, just a, I mean, it really was more about the country town. It's a transparency, mm. the fact we know everything that everybody else is doing and the buzzing that goes on within that. You know, it's all very important and busy, 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 but it's also contained as well. It doesn't doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and you're all watching each other and everybody knows. It makes sense to to maybe talk a little bit about the the author's notes. Yes, I, th um, I thought that was such an interesting part of, of the whole anthology because it gave so much more insight into yes. the short stories. Yes, yeah, well, that was really important to Gillian for us to do that. Um, and she really did want people to write stories that came from our, their, our hearts and our, and our background. So she wanted us to talk a little bit, um, a little bit about that, yeah. Um, yes, I wanted to um, actually. I wanted to ask you what you thought about the ending. The ending was a tricky one for me to decide about, and I'd forgotten how tricky it was until I did my reread of that um, that story. I had to decide if um, Sean was going to uh, release the. You know, he he made some sperm donations, and it was up to him to release them or not. Um, and knowing that if he did release them and they became children, then off his ghosts would go. And so he was kind of saying that these ghosts are going to have a home with the children. Um, and in the end, I decided that he would do that. He did, he did release his ghosts and he did basically, you know, allow his, his offspring, I guess you could say, um, to be haunted. But I just wasn't, I just, yeah, I, I don't know what you think about that ending. I was never quite sure whether or not he should have tricked the ghosts and never given them anywhere else to go 
or if he in the end had an affection for the ghosts and wanted to find a place for them to be. I think it was an interesting ending in that he sort of tried to um, I guess split his burden among so many different children but at the same mm. time he's leaving them with a kind of heritage that they have no way to fully understand at least until they're a bit older and can talk to the ghosts yes yeah that's right yes yeah. yes that's right so no and not not with the knowledge that he had from his father and and that sort of thing so yes but hope maybe the conversation and maybe he thought by the end that he wasn't now like I felt it was kind of a positive um, mm -hmm. ending in a weird kind of way that maybe he thought it was a good thing for them to be connected you know to carry their baggage with them that the ghosts are the baggage and maybe they needed that baggage to and it's a way to remember this ta this village that had disappeared and mm -hmm. yeah and yeah, I think, that sort of thing. yeah I think that's that's you can definitely see that in there I think it's a bit of a an ambiguous ending because you have that you have this uh, memory being passed on but at the same time it's passed on incompletely because there's yeah. nobody to explain it. There's nobody to say, oh, this is from the village of, of Skelton in Cornwall. Instead, it'll just be uh, thousands of very confused children <laughs> having baggage that they can't really comprehend. Yes, yes. And probably will have a difficult life for a long time and have invisible friends. And, you know, so he really is inflicting something on them that maybe is not the best, but then maybe will give them a more interesting life too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is, it is actually quite open-ended. There's a whole lot more story going on there. In fact, I had at some stage thought about doing, you know, a follow-up novel, really, that follows all those ghosts and where they were and who they ended up with and that sort of thing. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a it is, That would be really interesting. So if, if you do end up writing that, we're definitely going to read and cover it. <laughs> Oh, great. Oh, well, that's good inspiration for me. <laughs> I think there's also uh, certainly like a strong relationship to history that is evoked through that ending. Like the idea that that history is is transmitted and it's not necessarily impartial or fully accurate. And I feel like yes. that's a, a very strong uh, narrative undercurrent yes. that really oh, comes good. to the, the broader question of like narrative storytelling in general. And I, I think that's really actually... Uh, the kind of ending that we we really adore in literary studies in general to have kind of an open end that that says good. like well maybe we can't trust this at all yes yeah oh that's good no i think that's that's, that's great to hear i like that because you know, history is fascinating i'm reading i'm kind of obsessed by these weird old um english history books at the moment that i'm reading that are all about the, the uh the castles and abbeys of england and wales and they're so amazing they're written in about the 1870s i think so their history is, you know, what, 250 years old now. Um, and so with, there's so much more since then. And when I look these things up on Google, the things that they're saying, the understanding of that element of history has changed to a certain extent, um, which is really, really interesting. I find that fascinating. So what was absolutely definite at the time when these people were writing this book, um, it has shifted or is no longer important. And so, yeah, exactly what you're saying, Lucas, how History, history is um, through the eyes of the, or through the, through the words of the people who pass it on, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. so the ghosts, like those ghosts are the ones who are going to be taking their own stories. And each of those ghosts have, have a different story. They don't all agree at all. They've all got a very different view about what happened. So while well, you just talked about your interest in nonfiction and research, and I think that ties in very well with what you also said in your author's notes, that you were inspired by uh, the, the story of this uh, Gaelic village that seems to have been lost during the Highland clearances mm. but you then chose to set it in Cornwall and give it a, a kind of more mythical reason for the disappearance mm. so why why did you choose that um, I think I think probably because I was ready about Cornwall and it's such a fascinating place with the mythologies and that sort of thing and I loved all the sea stuff I love the sea stories and um, the ideas of all the men being lost at sea and all of that part of it. Um, I think that just, that just, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to sometimes track back when things shift because um, I do take lots of notes and I think, think a lot about these things um, and it's sometimes hard to track back. But I think it was really about that. It was really about the sea myths and um, all of the, the good luck things they do to keep the men safe when they're out fishing and all of those things. So, yeah. So no real particular reason apart from my little obsession with 
the Cornwall coast, and but definitely De Moria too. She wrote a lot of um, stories inspired by um, those stories. So yes, back to Daphne. <laughs> So you already <laughs> hinted at the, my last question on the hive of, on hive of glass, which is, well, you put it as Sean leaving parts of himself in this little country yeah. town, <laughs> and that's quite literal there. So, so can we talk about that? Yes, yes. So look, I, I can't remember what made me think of that element of the story, but really, it was him. It's him leaving. He has a little cafe, and as he's leaving fingernail shavings and bits of blood and each time hoping that he's going to pass on some of the ghosts by passing off some of his bits of his um his bodily bits um and I think you talk about how I, I say it very matter of factly and I think that's um because we do that don't we like we all have odd habits that seem completely ordinary to us and normal and then someone comes and stays for the weekend and they say oh do you keep your butter in a dish in the bathroom that's so strange <laughs> you know I don't do that by the way I don't keep my butter in a dish in the bathroom um but the weird little habits that we have that are completely just ordinary and normal to us and then from an observer but from an observer um they are that can be quite strange um and you don't realize until you somebody else observes you that, that it's strange so I think I was trying to capture a little bit of that this is just his absolute habit he's been doing it for so long that's complete habit um so it's no longer even weird it's just something he does and luckily nobody finds out in theory over the time I guess moving from one ghost story to to a, go a novel that has a, a whole bunch of ghosts in it um I want to talk about the grief hole for a bit and I guess the first question is, is you know where did the idea come from uh, I would categorize it, I think, very much as kind of a traditional gothic, uh, traditional novel in that sense. And um, you don't see very many of those uh, these days uh, because of all these these different horror offshoots. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, what made you decide to write in that mode? Mm. Well, again, I think the story um, told itself, I guess, like the mode, um, the, the, the story helped me figure out how to tell the story, if you know what I mean, the, the way it's told. Um, I did write and rewrite that one, that book novel, you know, any number of times, like probably five or six times, shifting the tone of it around. I keep changing the title and when I changed the title, I had to change the way I told the story. So for a little while it was called, it was um, about uh, calling her Saint Teresa. The main character was Saint Teresa. So the solace of Saint Teresa was what it was called for a little while. And so it was really built kind of around that as its, as its centre. But then when I sold it to the eventual um, publisher and I said, well, the grief hole was the original name. And he said, well, that's the name. That's what it has to be called. And so we did, you know, I kind of, it was as it was really, but then I did shift it around, I think one or two more times to um, have the grief hole, the various versions of the grief hole, the building itself and the physical grief hole um, as the center again. Yes. So yes, a, a long, a long process, really. And I can't quite remember. There was lots of inspiration for that one again. As far as the ghosts themselves, um, I think it probably came in a dream. I think that was probably one of those dream inspirations. But the building was you know, a place that I saw when I was in Montreal, and the um, Aunt Prudence was a lady I saw when I was living in uh, Fiji. Inspired that character, just the look of her. Um, so yeah, any any number of different inspirations that actually play into the novel. So like you said, you really do take uh, these normal things and and transform them into something more extraordinary uh, in order to tell these these narratives. And in the case of the grief hole, I think the title is really telling that it's about grief, uh, the grief of losing loved ones. Uh, that's one of the main motivations for Teresa to change uh, her scenery. It's also uh, the, the kind of investigation she's going through. If we think of it in terms of a mystery is also tied to uh, the death of a, of a family member. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, how did you decide to write about these kind of uh, traumatic events, uh, the loss of a loved one, and kind of have the story uh, circle around that so much? Mm. Yeah, it's, um, well, I'm going back to being, that concept of being brave as being a writer, like having to face up the things that are really hard to face up to. And every time I say this, I feel like I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I feel like I'm, I should, I should touch wood, but I've been really lucky in my life as far as grief goes. Like I haven't lost people very, very close to me. I've lost friends and 
um, distant family members, but not really, really close people. Um, so I've been very lucky. Um, but at the same time, it is absolutely at the heart of who we are as humans. And I think grief, like the baggage I was speaking about earlier, um, suffering grief or feeling grief just means that you've loved. And so to grieve is actually kind of a blessed thing in some ways. It's incredibly painful and torturous. But even grieving um, for a, a actor or a writer or somebody who dies, someone someone in the bigger the bigger world who you don't know, grieving for them just means that you've connected with them. Um, and you've had you've had a connection with them, so that's kind of a blessed thing um, to a certain extent. So I guess that's that's one of the reasons why I, I felt like I could um, I could talk about it. And then once you do make that decision, um, especially when you're writing horror and writing genre as well, you have to go there. You have to you can't pull back and do it in a, a week a week kind of a way. I suppose you have to really really try to explore it and get to, to get to what it means. And when you, when you are writing uh, in in this sense, it, it kind of has these uh, characters who do do follow some of the the tropes of the gothic, um, especially I guess more, the more modern, more popular ones would be like uh, Soul Evictus as, as a kind of a vampire like figure, um, and also a musical pop star. And I was wondering if that kind of has a relationship, like the the pop star of writing kind of became the vampire, or or how did that? <laughs> Uh, how did those ideas come together? Because I, I think it works really well. Oh, that's, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't, I didn't necessarily write him as a vampire, but obviously that's what he is. Um, there's certainly got elements of that. I really was just exploring um, the, the nature of charisma um, and how it sucks people in and how a charismatic person can say the most horrendous things and get away with the most horrendous things because they're charming and people love to be around them. Um, and how it, with singers in particular, they can just entrance an audience um, and I was thinking about some of the songs that sound like they're light and fluffy and happy songs and they're terribly sad songs or like this, there's a Smith song that's, I'm not going to sing because I'm a terrible singer, but it talks about that if a 10 ton bus kills the birth of us, like it's talking about dying, you know, this couple dying by being hit by a bus. And it's sung in this very lively, fluffy kind of tone of voice. So that contrast between what a song sounds like and the words that are being used. Um, it was Frank Sinatra was a little bit of an inspiration for that because even his song My Way is this pretty sad and devastating kind of a song, but he sings it in this strong and powerful voice. And so, yeah, it was all of those, it was all those things. It was about how someone with great charisma can um, be very manipulative. Um, so the music kind of also enters the text in the way that it influences kind of, uh, I guess, the, the pop star's uh, Soul of Victus's, uh charisma as well, to some extent. And that, that's yes. really interesting because we, we kind of think usually like, oh, writing is only influenced by writing. Uh, that's totally wrong, right? Students, that's yes. wrong. Don't, don't, don't believe that because, I mean, this is a great example right here uh, where, yeah, music can be uh, that exact interface where you can see uh, how how this works, and I, I think honestly, it it really is effective in being a, a critique of these kind of uh, rest like restrained happiness or bliss, um, and it, it it definitely also points out uh, how maybe it's it can be too easy to have these kind of charismatic uh, figures in our own lives, politicians or or musical stars. And we don't really know them and they, they might entrance us, but uh, maybe they're saying or doing things that, that we should be more uh, concerned about or something. And yes. I, I think that's uh, a message we can all carry into our everyday life pretty. Yes. No, pretty I heavy. think so too. And we'd be more critical of somebody who wasn't so charismatic. Like we're more critical of a poor, you know, a shop worker who gives us the wrong change or something, you know. Um, than we are of somebody who's a charismatic leader who does something terrible. Maybe I don't know. That's probably not really true. Um, but combinations of it was just how easily we can be um, seduced by people like that. And the words, like some of the, the the words in the songs that he's singing, are really quite horrible as well. Is you know talking about domestic violence and that sort of thing and trying to unleash that and, and allow it. And in fact, in one of the drafts, um, it, it really did feature a lot more. I did the music really had a lot more of a. a a seeping effect, I suppose, 
but just as the edits went on, I needed to sort of pull it back a bit just because the book was getting too long and it was distracting from the other elements of the story. But I think still it, um, it does exist there, I guess, because it was there once and the shadow of it is still, the shadow of it is still there. We're in, um, we're in talks actually that uh, somebody has just um, received some grant money to work through the first stage of translating it to the screen, which is very exciting. Um, very exciting and so I'm already thinking about the music and how it's going to sound like I know how I think it should sound but um, finding somebody to do that is going to be interesting so yeah. Yeah and I, I can imagine that's going to play a huge role in, in any cinematic uh, portrayal just because it, it is such a big part of of how we all deal with grief too. Yes oh absolutely those go-to songs the comfort songs you know we've all got those. The songs you, the song, yeah. And the way we can listen and re-listen to, that's something that fascinates me as well. The way we can listen and re-listen to a song hundreds of times, but we can't, like you can read a book, you know, maybe a dozen times, your most favourite book, or watch a movie maybe, you know, a lot of times. But a song, you, a favourite song you can listen to every day for the rest of your life. And that fascinates me. And the way that when people go to see a new band, like if you go and see a comedian, you want new jokes every time you see them. But if you go and see a band, you want them to play your favourite songs. You don't necessarily want to hear your new songs. So that, that part fascinates me. And maybe that's a part of the comfort stuff. We, we, it's a, there's a comfort to listening to those songs over and over again. Yeah. 